Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, tonight for your presence. We thank you for how you moved in the service this morning. We just pray that you'll continue to touch our hearts, move in a mighty way tonight as we sing songs of praise and worship, help our hearts to be focused on you. And Lord, let your word just find its place into our hearts tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
highest praise. Lord, not just at Christmas time, but God, all throughout the year, we want to lift you up. We want to look to you, Jesus. We want to become a little bit more like you. We just thank you for your example. We thank you for your presence that's with us tonight. God, inhabit the praises of your people. Draw us nearer to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right, sing this, sing this uh, lullaby, Christmas song. Most of us know it. Away in a manger. Praise the Lord.
how we ought to live. We thank you for the gift of eternal life, the hope of heaven one day with you. And God, I just pray that that hope, that joy would be alive in our hearts tonight, God. As we open up your word, that our hearts would be uh, fertile soil, God, for the seed of the word to fall on tonight. God, let it produce a harvest. God, evidence on the outside of us. Jesus, that you're doing something on the inside of us. We give you our hearts. We give you the remainder of this service. Have your way. Speak to us tonight by your Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated.
verse 6. I want to share a message with you tonight entitled, The Best Gift at Christmas. How many are looking forward? How many kids are looking forward to some good gifts on Christmas? Yes, how many big kids are looking forward to some, <laughs> some good gifts at Christmas? Uh, we want to look at some things tonight that I think will uh, tell us what the best gift is at Christmas. And it may not be what you think it is. In the December issue of Biography Magazine last year, several people answered that question, what do you want for Christmas? And I think if we asked the kids tonight, we'd probably get a wide range of uh, ideas, right? Of things that they want from Chris for Christmas. A hoverboard or a surface. Yeah. Jesus, that's a good one. She's a pastor's daughter, so she's, she thinks she's gaining points by saying that. But uh, last year, several uh, famous people were asked the question, what do you want for Christmas? And in Biography Magazine, this was their answer. these were their answers. Jennifer Aniston said for Christmas she wanted to learn to play the guitar, so she'd like a guitar. Uh, that wouldn't be so hard a gift to get, right? And you think some of these people have so much, and it's, it's interesting to see what they would want for Christmas. Jenny Garth, also an actress, said she wanted diamonds. What else? Right, ladies? Even that uh, probably wouldn't be a difficult gift to purchase for some of us, depending on how big the diamond was, right? Probably when you're Jenny Garth, the diamond has to be pretty big, though, right? Uh, when you're making as much money as, as some of these actors and actresses have made. Tony Danza wasn't asking for much. He just said a big, luxurious jet plane, right? That's so what's on our list this year, right? A big, luxurious jet plane. Kirstie Alley, uh, for her, uh, there would be nothing quite like a vacation to Italy. How many think that sounds good? Vacation to Italy sounds really good. But what do we really want for Christmas uh, this year? The best gift at Christmas, I believe the Lord wants to show us tonight, is, is a gift that no amount of money could buy. Amen? Have you found that to be true? It's really more the memories that we make at Christmas than it is the toys. We often forget the toys. So I think sometimes the best gift at Christmas is a gift that no amount of money can buy. The best gift at Christmas is not a temporary or fleeting uh, gift. Its batteries don't run out. Amen. Remember that when you were a kid? You got the new toy. Mom and Dad forgot that it has to have six deep batteries. And you're like, oh, man. And uh, the best gift, the batteries don't run out. It's not irrelevant or out of style within six months. You ever had one of those gifts? In fact, the best gift was really planned out from the foundation of the world. Amen. From the very beginning. The best gift of all this Christmas wasn't found under a tree but rather was found on a tree from the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ and Him crucified, what He would come to do for us uh, when He went to Calvary, that finished work. I want to have uh, Zoe and Brianna come up, and they're going to quote to you Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. That's our main text tonight, and uh, they've been working on this. Most of us know this verse. If you don't want to say it with them, you can't. Isaiah chapter 9, and verse 6. Go ahead. For unto us a child is born... Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All right, good job. Amen. That's the best gift at Christmas, isn't it? What that verse is talking about, who this Messiah, who this child, this son that would be born would be to us. The government would be upon his shoulder. His name would be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's what the world really needs. That's what we need this Christmas. Why is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, God's redemption story of Calvary's cross, the best gift at Christmas? I'm glad you asked. We're going to look at some things from that verse that tells us why that's the best gift at Christmas. We've got a PowerPoint there, Monica, if you've got it ready. Oh, yeah, there's a video. Let's watch this quick video, and then we'll go to the PowerPoint. Okay.
Christmas is really about Jesus Christ. Amen. And the things that, again, money cannot buy. I want to look at uh, some points tonight from Isaiah 9, 6. Why Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, is the best gift at Christmas. And uh, some things that we can consider tonight. Number one, because it tells us in that verse, the government will soon be upon his shoulders. Aren't we glad for that? Right now, Barack Obama has one of the most significant governments in the world upon his shoulders, right? Our own country. But in approximately 323 days, 5 hours, and 15 minutes, many are looking forward to the next president of the most significant government in the world. And we hope that we still are one of the most significant governments in the world. And we need God's help. Many are counting the days. In fact, if you go on the website as I was studying for this message, I was amazed at how many countdowns there are <laughs> on the internet for that. We're in an election season, but folks, we better be praying. Christians, we better vote. We better exercise uh, our, our rights as citizens and pray. But one day soon, the government's not going to be on the shoulders of a Democrat or Republican. Amen? It's going to be on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. And that's really when things will be made right. All the things that are so wrong will be corrected. There are no perfect governments in the world. God's kingdom is not Democrat or Republican, Libertarian or Green Party. In fact, God's kingdom, how we know, is not even going to be a democracy. Did you know that? As much as we have shared democracy, and democracy has brought freedom to a lot of countries, it's also brought some problems. God's kingdom is not a democracy. There won't even be any campaigning, amen, when the government is upon his shoulders. Aren't we glad for that? It seems like the campaign season gets longer and longer every presidential election that we have. There won't even be any campaigning because God's kingdom is a theocracy, amen? What he says in this book, what he speaks will be what happens. And uh, that'll be a time when we can rejoice, when the government is upon his shoulders. Listen to this quote, Christ, Christ will reign supreme over the entirety of the world in the coming kingdom age, after the rapture, after the seven year great tribulation period. And in that point in time, he'll be putting down all sin, not lifting it up, not allowing it to continue like we see in too many places in the world. He'll be putting down rebellion and any vestige of Satan's kingdom. And that's what we have to look forward to. That's why Jesus Christ and who he came to be as that little baby in a manger is so significant this Christmas. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Listen to these verses. Daniel chapter 7, starting with verse 13. It says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, all nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And that's the government that Jesus will put into place, a government that will be righteous. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, it says this, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever. There won't be a majority vote, amen, to vote Jesus out. There won't even be a want for that because he's going to reign in righteousness. He's going to reign in peace. There'll be no more war. It says that they'll turn their, their, uh, their weapons into plowshares. There won't be a need for those weapons anymore because Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, will be reigning forever and forever. The best gift at Christmas is knowing that all the corrupt governments and government governing officials are one day very soon going to be dethroned. And that's something that we can look forward to. That's not an escapist mentality, right? That's the truth. And that's the hope that we have. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, our Redeemer, He is physically going to reign over all the earth. And that's something that we ought to be preparing for. The government will be upon His shoulders, not Barack Obama, not Ben Carson, not Donald Trump, not Hillary Clinton, not Bernie Sanders. The government is going to be upon Jesus' shoulders. And that's something that we need to look forward to as we remember the best gift 
at Christmas. Number two, why is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world, the best gift at Christmas? Because his name will be called Wonderful. How many have ever seen the show Shark Tank on ABC? We watch it all the time. They have a bunch of entrepreneurs that come on, and uh, they have a panel of really rich people, investors, and they're called the Sharks. And these entrepreneurs basically have to pitch their business, and they're looking for a lot of times hundreds of thousands of dollars to help them uh, get their business going. And on that program, one of the Sharks is Kevin O'Leary, and he's a Canadian businessman, an investor, and a journalist, financial commentator, TV personality. Kevin himself, if you've ever watched the show, and many of the contestants refer to him as Mr. Wonderful, right? Mr. Wonderful, Kevin O'Leary. Uh, the one that we're referring to tonight from Isaiah 6 9 is not Kevin O'Leary, amen? The Mr. Wonderful that we're talking about is not a mere mortal. He has more money, though, than Kevin O'Leary, doesn't he? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And he's not wonderful because of his greed and selfishness. He's wonderful because he came and he stretched out his hands on a cruel cross for you and me, amen, so that we could have eternal life. And uh, when he speaks, all, all he has to do is just say the word and something comes into existence. I think that goes beyond a mere mortal, amen. His name is Jesus. That's the real Mr. Wonderful. And that's who we ought to be looking to today during this Christmas season. When the Lord inspired Isaiah the prophet to prophesy about the Christ child, the Messiah, God wanted to, the world to know that he would be wonderful in his teaching, in his miracles, in his doings, and in his actions. The circumstances of his birth as well were wonderful. You think about it. He was born in a stable, very insignificant place. But think of the significance of that event in such an insignificant place. God wants to speak to us as he did this morning in the message that Mary Ann shared. It's oftentimes just ordinary people in sometimes dark places that God reaches down and he touches and he uses to do something powerful, just like he did with the Christ child. And God wants us to get a hold of that. All of these things were wonderful. His coming into the, into the world, his death on a hill called Mount Calvary, his resurrection and his ascension, they were all wonderful when we understand what they really meant for each one of us. Amen? His name is wonderful. We know the song. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. He's Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King. He's master of everything. His name is wonderful. He's Jesus, my Lord. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God is He. Bow down before Him. Love and adore Him. His name is wonderful. It's Jesus, my Lord. He's the one that's wonderful, amen? And we can just begin to sing that song when maybe everything in our life isn't quite so wonderful, right? And it brings the presence of the Lord. And we realize all the temporary stuff that gets us so weighed down, it probably doesn't really matter. When the trumpet sounds, when Christ comes back, it's going to be the fact that His name is wonderful that really matters. And we need to remember that this Christmas. The best gift at Christmas is having a daily personal relationship with Jesus, our Messiah, our Savior, because of his finished work on the cross for each one of us. No one ever lived for Jesus and on their deathbed cried out with regret or anguish. Have you heard of anybody that way? Nobody has. I've lived a long time. Most of you have lived longer than me. I've never heard of anyone regretting a life lived for Jesus, saying they wish they had never gone to church, they had never heard about Jesus. That doesn't happen, does it? Why? Because his name is wonderful. 
They don't cry out in regret or anguish for having made the decision to follow him because he is truly wonderful. He answers prayer, amen? He meets our needs. He's our healer. He's our peace speaker. And he has made life and life more abundantly available to all of us if we'll just simply put our faith in him, amen? Who he is and what he's done for us. His name is wonderful. That's why Jesus is the best gift at Christmas. Number three, because his name will be called Counselor. That's why Jesus and what he did at the cross is the best gift at Christmas. The supreme wisdom with which this Jesus counsel should make him so preeminent as a counselor that he's not even mentioned in the same sentence with some of the so-called counselors the world and too much of the modern church are looking to, Dr. Phil. When you say Dr. Phil and Jesus in the same sentence, you've just brought Jesus down into the muck, haven't you? And when you're talking about counselors, he is the supreme counselor. Dr. Phil, Oprah, Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, the Dalai Lama, the Pope. Jesus is not even in the same realm as these mere mortals, as these people that people are looking to today. Some who even call themselves Christian are looking for counsel from these so-called counselors. Jesus is my counselor, man. Jesus and his word gives us wisdom and direction for our lives. And he and he alone is the one we ought to be looking to. And people who will help point us to him, amen, as our supreme counselor. Listen to this quote. This name counselor expresses the idea that his is the supreme counsel, the one who is qualified to give counsel, leading and guidance to all created beings. It is sad when the far greater majority of the church refuses his glorious counsel and thereby refuses him as counselor and rather accepts the flawed pitiful, decrepit counsel of poor, weak men, most of it human, humanistic psychology. And the church is looking to humanistic psychology instead of God's word, instead of the counsel of Jesus Christ. And God help us, God forgive us, God get us back on track. Psalm 60 verse 11, and Psalm 108 verse 12, those two verses are identical. Have you found that when something's repeated in the Bible, it's not because God had a senior moment. It's because he was trying to emphasize something, right? Two times in the book of Psalms, the same exact words were used. I think God's trying to tell us something. It says, give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. Why do we look to man and think that we're going to find help? Think that we're going to find wisdom. Think that we're going to find counsel that only God can give us. Jesus is the one we ought to be looking to when we're facing trouble, and his help is help that will get us where we need to go. Psalm 146, verse 3, do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, talking about flesh and blood, human beings, in whom there is no help. Amen? Psychology doesn't work because the person who's counseling you as you're sitting on that couch is in the same place you are. Only Jesus, the perfect Son of Man, can give us counsel because He is not flawed. He's not sinful like the rest of humankind. Isaiah chapter 31, verse 1, it says this, Woe to those who go down to Egypt. Egypt is always a type of the world, right? Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. God wants us to seek Him for wisdom, for counsel, for direction in our lives, not the ways of the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting with verse 19, it says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And if you read that entire passage in context, how does it say that God made foolish the wisdom of this world? By giving us the best gift that we could ever receive. And that's Jesus and the cross. It says in verse 18 that it's because of the cross that man's wisdom was made foolish. Man had tried and has continued to try to save himself with so many different philosophies and, and, and formulas. 
And God said, just by the foolishness of preaching Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross, that's how you get saved. That's how you find help. That's how you find freedom and liberty. And it doesn't make sense to the scholarly, does it? It sounds too simple. But that's God's plan, and that's how he's chosen to save us. And through the foolishness of the cross, we know we have the power of God working in our lives. And we need to hold on to that. The best gift at Christmas is knowing Jesus, the only one qualified to give us counsel regarding not only this life, but eternity. Amen? He wants to give us insight into eternity. We have the written word, the Bible, but we also have the living word, Jesus Christ. He counsels us no matter what circumstances we may be facing. He's there to speak into our lives and to help us if we'll look to him. Number four tonight, why is Jesus Christ and him crucified the best gift at Christmas? Because his name will be called Mighty God. Second Chronicles 16.9. Most of us have heard this verse before. A good verse to remember. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. What's he looking for? What is God looking for today? When he looks across the United States of America, when he looks at Colorado Springs, torn by tragedies, one after the other over the last two or three months, when God looks back and forth across our families, our community, our loved ones, our friends, he's looking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Will we just be loyal to the Lord and say, God, I want what you want. God, I want your will in my life. If we'll do that, he's looking for someone to show himself strong in. Amen. That he can get the glory. Not mankind. Not a person. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 24. It says this, O Lord God, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? Think of the children of Israel and what they witnessed. God was revealing himself to his people that he is a mighty God. And God's about to wrap this up. Do we know that, folks? He's about to wrap this up. And he's going to show himself one more time as the mighty God. Amen. There's people on this earth, they think they're in control. But God's about to say, oh, no, uh, -uh as we say, right? And he's going to show them that he is the mighty God. He's going to do exactly what the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation say. And he's going to judge sin once and for all. And we better understand his redemption plan. We better understand that he wants to show his glory in us, the church, in these last days. And there's a great falling away, but there's also a great harvest. And we better get in tune with what the Lord is wanting to do. He's a mighty God, and he's going to do mighty things in these last days. Joshua chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. It says this, For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you uh, until you had crossed over. As the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over, that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Have, has God answered some prayers in your life? Has he worked some miracles? He's still the mighty God. He can still do what no other power can do in your life if you look to him. And he wants you to know him as the mighty God. God is mighty enough to save you from your sins and an eternity in hell if you believe him. Amen. He's mighty enough to save you. God is mighty enough to heal your sick body of any sickness and any disease right now, tonight, if you'll just trust that by his stripes you're healed. Amen. He's mighty enough to do that. God is mighty enough to answer your prayers. Amen. He's mighty enough to bring the breakthroughs that you're believing for tonight that maybe nobody else would even understand. God's mighty enough to bring those breakthroughs that you need if you'll simply place your faith exclusively, not in the work of your own hands, but in the it is finished work that Jesus accomplished at Calvary. God is mighty and even delights in what man calls impossible. You may say in your mind, God, there is no way that can be fixed. There's no way that promise can be fulfilled. God delights in what man calls impossible and he'll do for his own glory and praise that work in your life, that mighty work if you'll just believe him. Amen? Just believe him. He is the mighty God. The best gift at Christmas 
is knowing that your life is in the palm of the one named Jesus who is the mighty God. Nobody can snatch you out of his hands. We don't believe in unconditionally eternal security, but we do believe in conditional. As long as we stay in the will of God, we're his, and no one can take us out of his hand. And we can trust in Jesus, the mighty God. Number five, why is Jesus and him crucified the best gift of Christmas? Because his name will be called the Everlasting Father. Think about this tonight with me for just a moment, if you will. Think about our own society, the United States of America. How many fatherless homes, fatherless children we have in our own country? It's an epidemic. It's really a scourge, if we were to be honest. Now think about what's going on in our society. It's a scourge upon the United States of America. Listen to these statistics. 43% of U.S. children live without their father, according to the Department of the Census. 90% of homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. 63% of youth suicides, which are on the rise in the day and age that we're living in, are from fatherless homes. Fatherless boys and girls are twice as likely to drop out of high school twice as likely to end up in jail, four times more likely to need help for emotional or behavioral problems. What are the numbers about fatherless people in our society? 64.3 million people are the estimated number of fathers across the nation. 24 million children live absent, 34% live absent of their biological father. About 40% of children in father absent homes have not seen their father at all during the past year. Think about that. 26% of absent fathers live in a different state than their children. And 50% of children living absent their father have never set foot in their father's home. And then we wonder why we have the problems that we have in our society. Thank God for some single moms who often have to step in and be mom and dad. But you know what? God's design was for a father and a mother to raise those kids and appoint them to Jesus and let Jesus be the center of their home. We live in a fatherless generation. But aren't you glad Jesus wants to be an everlasting father to those who are fatherless, to those who are broken, to those who are thinking life's not even worth living? Jesus says, I'll be a father unto you. Amen? And we can shine that love of Jesus to the many, many people all around us who may completely uh, relate to those statistics that we just read. They don't have a dad that they can look to. And if you do, you ought to be grateful. Amen? But we have Jesus. What's the answer for these staggering numbers of fatherless? It's to point them to Jesus who can be their everlasting father, one who will always provide for them. Isn't that what a good father does? Always provide for them. Jesus will do that. One who will always protect them. Jesus will always protect us. Amen? He has us in the, the, under the shelter of his wings. One who will always look out for what's best for them, giving them a hope and a future. Jesus will be that kind of father if we'll point people to him. One who will lead them in the way of truth, by example and by character. That's Jesus. Amen? And that's what this world is looking for. He is the everlasting Father. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the last two verses, verse 17 and 18, it says, Therefore come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. Do you see that? I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. God wants us to have an inheritance. Amen? He wants us to have all the rights and privileges of a son or a daughter. If we'll just separate ourselves from sin in the world, come to the foot of the cross and receive what He paid for us there. He wants us to be a part of His family. The best gift at Christmas is the protection, the provision, the safety in the arms of Jesus that we have when we know He's our everlasting Father. Amen? He's wonderful. He's counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting Father. Number five, or number six tonight, I'm sorry. Number six, his name will be called the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. Listen to this quote. It is true that the peacefulness of the Lord is not very clearly seen in the world or even in the church today. The reason is that our Lord's kingdom is yet to come into the hearts of most men. This will happen fully in the coming kingdom age. Have you ever seen someone who was lost in sin, maybe a drug addict or 
Their life was just a total mess. Jesus came in and totally changed that person. Their character, their demeanor, their attitude changed completely. I've seen it in some of my relatives and praise God for it. There's a lot of people still lost. They need that transformation to take place in their life. And Jesus wants to do that. He is the Prince of Peace. As horrific a death as the cross was for Jesus, it's what brought mankind genuine peace. And we ought to remember that. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. It says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Christ our peace, for he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, there, thereby putting to death the enmity. We were once enemies, far off, couldn't even approach God because of our sin. But Jesus stepped in, 100% God, 100% man, and he bridged the gap, amen, so that we could have peace. Peace is knowing that your sins are forgiven, knowing that the guilt that you feel because of your mistakes is gone because Jesus took it upon himself. That's peace, not just some convincing in our mind that the bad things are going to go away, right? It's really knowing that Jesus paid it all, amen? All to him I owe. Sin and left a crimson stain. Jesus washed it white as snow. He's our peace. I saw this picture a couple of years ago, and I think this is a good, it's kind of a clever cliche, but I think it's a good thing to remember when we're talking about Jesus being the Prince of Peace. No Jesus, no peace, right? No Jesus, and you know peace. If you don't have Christ in your life, there's no way you can really know peace. But once you know him, once you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you can have peace. You can get up without regrets. Amen. You can walk this life and chase after the dreams and goals that God's put upon your heart because you know that the Prince of Peace is with you to help you. The best gift at Christmas is knowing that we don't have to live in fear, enslaved by terrorism and evil, that we're going to see only increase more and more in these last days uncertain of life circumstances because of turmoil and chaos, we can experience the special peace that only Jesus, the Prince of Peace, can minister to a heart and to a life. And because of these things that we're talking about in this message, Jesus and what he did at the cross, that's the best gift. Amen. It's not under a tree. It was put on a tree for each, of, each one of us. That's the best gift at Christmas. No man, no demon in hell, the devil himself can't steal what Jesus did for us at the cross. If we'll put our faith in that, the rewards are everlasting. Amen. Streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl, and we're going to see our Savior face to face, and it's going to be soon. That's what we need to remember. Not whether we got all the latest and greatest gadgets at Christmas, amen, but whether we have Jesus in our hearts. Would you stand with me tonight? I want us to close with a song and in prayer. Maybe you're hearing this message tonight and I don't know where your heart's at. The Lord does. But the best gift at Christmas is offered to you tonight. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. If your life's not right with Him, you've never given your heart to the Lord, that's the best thing that you can do. That makes what Jesus did worthwhile because he came to save sinners. Amen. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you've once known the Lord and you've gotten away from him and you need to rededicate your heart to Jesus Christ, what better night to do that than tonight. Amen. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. And we need to make sure that we receive the gift that Jesus has made available to us. Everlasting life. Not just fire insurance. Amen. Knowing that we're not going to hell, but real abundant life. We can live in that every day. So I want us together to pray this prayer. If you would, pray this prayer after me. And if you're listening to this message later on or you're here tonight and you need to rededicate your heart to the Lord, pray this prayer in faith. And I believe God will respond. God responds to faith. Amen. Just simple belief in what he's done at the cross. And he can come in and he can cleanse you. He can give you a fresh start tonight. So pray this prayer with me if you would. Dear Heavenly Father, Dear Heavenly Father I come to you in Jesus' name. 
admitting and acknowledging that I am a sinner. I believe Jesus that you died on the cross for my sins, paying the penalty that I deserved. And I am in need of you, Jesus, to be my Savior, to be my Lord. Please forgive me for all my sin. Wash me, make me clean, and help me from this day forward to live for you. Thank you for saving me and making me ready for heaven. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And again, it's not the words that save us, but in faith. If you pray that tonight, God says you're saved. You're forgiven. The dominion of sin is broken over your life. And Jesus is now the master over everything. He's your Lord. And if you'll walk in relationship with him, share your decision tonight. If you rededicated your heart to the Lord, share it with someone who will help you in that walk with the Lord. Give us a call. Send us an email. We want to help you in your walk with the Lord. I want us who are here tonight, I think most of us are believers. I want us to sing that song, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way. Can we do that? And as we just uh, close out this service, Let's remember who Jesus told us he is. Amen. He is wonderful. He is counselor. Maybe you can look back on this past year and remember how wonderful God had been in a certain circumstance or situation. How he counseled you and gave you wisdom when you didn't know what to do. I can think of some things this year. How he is the mighty God. He did what was impossible in your own strength. He is the everlasting father. Maybe there was a time where God just wrapped his arms around you and told you that you're safe, you're okay. I've got you. Amen. Those are some good times to remember. And as we sing this song, He's the Prince of Peace. Maybe you need it tonight to be one of those things. But as we sing this, let's thank Him for who He is. And let's trust Him to continue to be that in our life tonight. Maybe you know somebody who's facing a struggle. I've got some co-workers where I'm working part-time who had some lost loved ones, died in a car accident unexpectedly last week. And, uh, you know, things like that happen in our life. And it's at moments like that we need the Prince of Peace. Amen. Maybe you know some people that need a special touch from the Lord. As we sing this, you can uh, trust the Lord, thank Him for yourself, but pray for these that need a touch in their life tonight. And let's believe God to do uh, something powerful.
pray for each other tonight. And let's just allow the Holy Spirit uh, throughout this week to cement into our hearts what we've heard in this message. The government will be upon His shoulders. Amen. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's who Jesus is. Amen. He is those things. And let's not be afraid to share that as God gives us opportunity as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, tonight for your word. I thank you for each person that's here tonight. God, reveal yourself in, in a more real, more powerful way to each one of us. Help us to see you for who you really are and for the price that you paid for us at Calvary. Let us realize tonight that's the best gift. If we get nothing else this Christmas, the best gift that we can get is what you did for us at Calvary. Giving us a hope of heaven. Giving us forgiveness of sins. Giving us from freedom from uh, sin's control over our lives. And God, I just pray that we'll recognize who you are. You are a wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Give us opportunity this week and this Christmas season among our loved ones and friends to share who you are and what you've done with them. God, we don't want people that we love to be in the process of dying without Jesus in their life. So God, help us to sow a seed. Help us, God, to make a difference in someone's life and to point them to you. Lord, we just believe you for good things. Lord, I pray that you'll bless each one of us as we leave this place tonight. Keep us close to you throughout the week. Let us be tools in your hand, instruments that you can flow through. And Lord, I pray that you'll get the glory through every circumstance that we walk through this week. We just give you praise. We give you thanks for all that you're going to do in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen.